I'd like to start by thanking the audience. Uh, this is heroic at 8 p.m. on Friday night. The UN panel on climate change, which we've been talking about, as you know, received the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore this year. And it's released its fourth assessment report. The report has updated measurements that show that the temperature is rising about a tenth of a degree per decade. And the report also discusses climate simulations for the 40 scenarios that Pushkar mentioned. These are the 40 scenarios. And we're plotting atmospheric, I'm, I'm sorry, we're plotting carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels in these scenarios. And the thing that's striking about them is how different they are. The total emissions from top to bottom range by a factor of four to one. But there's something more. If you look at 2100 and look at the bottom scenario, it's going down. If you look at the top scenario, it's going up. So if you include the years after 2100, we're talking more like a range of 10 to 1 in emissions from these scenarios. If you look in detail in the scenarios, you find that oil production in 13 of them has not peaked by 2100. Does anyone here believe that? I, I, I don't either. Yeah. So I, in this discussion, I really would like to tighten up this range. And the approach I'll take is historical. Uh, I'll look at a history of U.S. production, oil production, and British coal production, do fits to normal curves, and then see what we could have projected, and then expand that to world fossil fuels. And I'll just skip over the oil. It'll be quick on the oil because there are, there are obviously a lot of people here who are much more expert than I am, but it will give a framework and some contrast with how I'm looking at coal. Once we have the pro projections, we'll see what the implications are for, for alternatives, and then we'll look at some simulations for carbon dioxide and for temperature. This is a cumulative plot for U.S. oil, and uh, it's got data up to the present year and then after that, uh, the, the, the curve that's sticking out the end into the future is a normal curve. Uh, that's what statisticians use for looking at test scores, heights. It, it's their standard curve. And the shape is fixed. Uh, but I have scaled the two axes to get the best fit I can. And the scaling is just done with Excel. There's a button in Excel called Solver, and you punch the button and you go get a beer, check on the ball game, and come back and mark down the number, and that's, that's the way you do all of the fits in the, in the talk. Now, from the production scale, we can get the ultimate production. And this is what we'll be interested in in the course of this talk, and, I'll, and it has to do with the very long time constants for temperature change that Pushkar has been talking about. Often, we'll want to make comparisons to reserves, and for that, we'll look at remaining production, which we get simply by subtracting the current cumulative production. And in this case, the reserves are larger. I'm sorry, the remaining production is larger, and that's what we would expect for oil. Uh, oil's hard to find. People are still finding it. Now, that's really, in many ways, a very convincing fit, I should say that I've spent, pardon me, I've spent many years in labs making measurements. I never get data that's this good. And this is just almanac data. And so it, it, you ask the question, could, have we, could we have done it earlier? And I, I've taken the same approach, just fit to a normal curve. Uh, the bottom symbols you see are, are the cumulative again, and that's what we're comparing to. And then the blue curve is our fit, but it's historical. So a fit for 1940 uses data up through 1940. And it's, it's a fit someone could have done then, uh, because people have known how to calculate normal curves for hundreds of years. 
And when you look at it, when we're in the 30s, we're kind of off the top of the chart. But then when you get into the 1940, it flattens out and it looks actually pretty good. And then it bounces around for a while. You almost have the sense of something being tracked or locking on to something. And then since 1980, it's really quite flat and that curve looks like it's going the same place as the cumulative curve. Now we can compare this with Hubbard's numbers. These are reservoir based at, at their heart. Hubbard had 150 billion barrels in his 1956 paper, and that's a very good estimate. Uh, he also used a 200 billion barrel estimate from de Gaulier and McNaughton, and that one is outstanding. But the interesting thing is Hubbard, who was the person who really realized that this could be a bell-shaped curve, didn't try to, and, and he was interested in this problem before 1956, he didn't try to fit to a normal curve at that time, uh, because if he had, he could have done it in the 40s and he would have gotten the same answer. Now, at the time, there were lots of people, as now, making projections about U.S. oil. I won't show the full range. The most prominent was the one from the Geological Survey, the group headed by Vincent McKelvey, who later became the director. And I suppose that at the time, I would have thought that was the right one because of the prestige of the survey. Uh, but it, it appears to be now three times too high. There's another survey in 1995. And again, even though this represents 100 person years of work, it's tens of thousands of pages when you look at these assessments. You look at those two curves below, and this one could be three times too high again. I don't know why this is. If you've read Ken DeFay's book, Hubbard's Peak, his theory is that it's really a bureaucratic response, that they tend to just naturally choose high numbers. I don't know. Now, I mentioned reserves. At, you know the definition. Uh, reserves are resources that can be extracted at current prices and current technology. Now, coal reserves are calculated traditionally in three steps. First, their measurements of the coal seams. In the early stages, people look at outcrops. In the later stages, they use drilling cores. And then people apply restrictions. For many years, the World Energy Council used 30 centimeters minimum seam thickness and 1,200 meters maximum depth. And then you have forbidden areas like national parks. And once you've got this total base, for the calculation, then you multiply by a recovery factor to account for coal that's left in the mine. And for many years, the geological survey used a, a recovery factor of one half. Now the interesting thing, when you look at that way of calculating it, it actually doesn't fit the definition very well. The definition talks about current prices and current technology. Those numbers that people use for calculating reserves are stable for several decades. In fact, that kind of calculation looks a lot more like ultimate recovery or remaining production. That's okay for us because that's what we're interested in tonight. There was a paper from the German Energy Watch group this spring. It's a German think tank and it was not a refereed paper. It was simply something that was put up on their website with a, a, a press release. And, Wolfgang Zittel and Jörg Schindler. And they had a very interesting idea, a, a really a radical idea. They had noticed that for many countries, coal reserves were going down. And this is the opposite situation for, from, from oil. They were going down much faster than you could account for by production. And they proposed that the remaining production would be less than the reserves. Again, this is a radical idea. It is not like gas or oil. Uh, in fact, as far as I know, no one in climate change uses a number that's less than reserves. In fact, we'll see they tend to assume much larger numbers than reserves. And in fact, even in considering exhaustion of fossil fuels, people don't assume less than reserves. But we'll be exploring this idea. Now the other kind of plot I'll use when we get to coal is the standard rate plot that Ken DeFace developed and John Del Herrera used. In this plot, it, it, most of you I'm sure have seen it, 
it's, it's a little confusing because you can't find time any place, but it has cumulative production on the bottom axis and the growth rate on the y-axis. And this takes bell-shaped curves and S-shaped cumulative curves and turns them into almost straight lines, so you can look at trends. And this, this is world oil and gas uh, and the energy equivalent of the gas. Um, and you can see a good trend starting in about 1983. Now, if you have good eyes or an imagination, um, the, the dashed line is the fit. Again, it's a, a fit in Excel. Uh, it curves a little bit, and the reason is I'm fitting to normal curves, which aren't quite straight on these plots. You get 3.2 trillion barrels, and for a comparison, I'll use the World Energy Council reserves. Um, part of the reason is that the focus tonight is coal. In coal, there's really only one set of reserves, and that's the World Energy Council. Everyone else uses those, and so just to be consistent, I'll take their reserves for oil and gas as well. Now, they, they are larger than the reserves, which is reassuring, or this estimate. Uh, and we also have, what is it, 500 billion barrels of OPEC reserves that who knows what they have. The number that's different, however, is the, the IPCC. If you look at their scenarios, they assume something like 11 to 15 trillion barrels is available depending on the discovery success. So this is a totally different number. It's four times as large as what we're talking about, or frankly, what almost anyone is talking about in the oil and gas world. Now we'll switch to coal. Britain produced over half of the world's coal in the 1800s, and it's been a lot of coal. It's equivalent to lowering England by six inches, which is amazing. And Britain has its Hubbard. Uh, his name was Stanley Jevons, and he was interested, uh, as we are, in how long the coal would last. And uh, Britain had, by a static calculation at that time, 900 years of coal. But Jevons had figured out that the coal production was increasing 3.5% per year. And you all know what this means. It doesn't last for 900 years. And, and, and he figured it out, too. If you can make out the curve on the far right in the figure, uh, you can see this curve carefully calculated going up. Uh, and it shows that they, he, they run out of coal in the 20th century, not in 900 years. So this is what happened. It's a bell-shaped curve, rather like US oil production. It peaked in 1913. And today, we're at 6% of peak. There are 50 mines left out of 3,000. And if you look at the government websites that list the reserves, you can see why. Many of the mines have less than 10 years of coal, and they're simply running out one by one. Now, we can do the same fit for the ultimate production that we did for American oil. And I've got the Cumulative on the bottom, again, for comparison, those are the green symbols. And again, the blue is our historical fit for the ultimate. In the 1870s, we're not stable, we're off the chart. But by the time you get to 1880 and 1890, we're not too bad. Now, there's a bit of an overshoot around the, around the time of the First World War. But after the 20s, it's remarkably good. It's within 5% of where we seem to be going now. And then it's interesting to compare to the reserve estimates. The Victorians were outstanding geologists, and they did outstanding reserve surveys. Edward Hall did, in 1864, did a survey which was better, I think, than anything the United States had until the 70s. Um, he made allowances for places where the seams had eroded. He also had a recovery factor, which was a, a very nice idea. It's two he used two-thirds. It leaves coal for the pillars that support the roof and the mine. Now, even though this was an excellent survey, we now know 150 years later that it was too high. We've only produced 29% of those reserves. Now, the British also started the World Energy Council conferences, which have given the coal reserves over the years, and so there's another sequence, the diamonds, open diamonds, there that show you the reserves over time. 
Now, the early surveys did not have a recovery factor, and, and these are higher than Hull's estimate. And you see something very interesting when you get to 1970 or so. The reserves crash. Now, what's happening there is that someone in the government has figured out that there are no good prospects for new coal mines. And so then they change the reserves from all of the coal in the country to the coal that's within reach of the mines that are still producing, which is a tiny number compared to the original number. And so this is almost a kind of sequence that reser coal reserves go through, and several countries are in, at various stages of this collapse in Europe right now. Now let's turn to American coal. In American coal, transportation is a dominant factor. If you buy a ton of coal in Wyoming at the mine, it costs you $7, which is amazing. If you buy that same ton in Alabama, it costs you $50. So when you talk about coal, the railroads really are getting a lot of the money. This is American coal production, and we'll look first at the curve that says total. This one's a lot more complicated than British coal. But if you split out, split out the Western coal, that's a simpler curve, and we'll start with that. Um, that started, that rise started because of the Clean Air Act during the Nixon administration. It encouraged the use of low sulfur coal, which the West has. So here's the rate plot for coal west of the Mississippi. And this was the curve that got me thinking that maybe we could use this kind of analysis for looking at world coal production. It's really a beautiful plot. You see the production before 1970 petering out to a very low level. And then the Clean Air Act, and then you get this amazing transition. That's these open symbols. And then you go up to a new trend. That's the solid symbols again. And they fit the curve beautifully since then. And just a reminder, uh, you can see that, that the fitted line is curved. That's the normal. Uh, I don't get to control how much that curves. It's just a beautiful fit. Now, the, re the fit is for 33 billion tons. The reserves are 79 billion tons. So we're talking two to three times as large for the reserves as for the remaining production. Again, totally different from oil and gas. Now, there's one complication for Western coal reserves, and that's Montana. Montana has the largest coal reserves of any state, but they do almost no coal mining. The, the total coal mining business in Montana is about $400 million a year. That's less than the budget, the annual budget for the university I work at. Now, it's possible that sometime, someday, Montana will decide to start producing coal, and so I've made a, a separate allowance as a, a separate region for that. Now, it's interesting in this context to look at the history of the reserves for American coal. The first reserves studies were done by the Coal Commission in the 20s based on geological uh, surveys from the USGS. And that one gave 1,500 billion tons, 4,000 years of coal. Now, that's, that seems like a lot. Now, when we look at the next round, of reserves. That's done by the USGS, Paul Averett, who did worked on this problem for about 30 years. And you can see now that our reserves are running about 800 billion tons. Now, the difference between these is, is actually connected to Western coal. It's in basins, and at the time of the early surveys, people only had measurements on outcrops. Later on, when they did some drilling, they realized that this coal is, is just way too deep to get at. And so that's why this cut back. Now, in the 60s, people at the Bureau of Mines became concerned that the USGS was not taking account of the many areas where, uh, that had to be ruled out for production. And so they took Averitt's reserves and did their own analysis on them. And these are the reserves that we use today. The Bureau Pardon, the Bureau of Mines is gone, but the EIA has picked this up. And you can see now we're down to 200 billion tons uh, and about 200 years of coal. So you can see time really flies when you're talking about coal. We've gone from 4,000 years to 200 years in only 80 years. 
And this leads us to the, the really big question of the night, are U.S. coal reserves too high? Now, you may have seen this report from the National Academy of Sciences this summer. I put up a paragraph from the report, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Uh, the report says that we're still using the same surveys that Paul Averett did in the 70s. People have done spot checks in a few areas, and in the places they've done spot checks with careful studies of the reserves, they found out that the mineable coal is much less than the reserves. In the example that was quoted in the interview in the New York Times, Ed Rubin from Carnegie Mellon gave a factor of five off, but I have no idea what the factor should be across different parts of the country. They did four spot checks and they were all very high. This figure can give you a sense of what they're taking into account. It's from the assessment for Illinois. Uh, one relevant for this group, there are a million oil, oil and gas wells in the country and you can't mine coal near one of those wells. You also can't mine coal near an abandoned mine. They fill up with water and gas and, and they're quite dangerous to break into. In addition, people have started to apply restrictions based on the layer thicknesses between the coal seams, and that also reduces the reserves. Each of these restrictions that people take into account in the, as the surveys develop and become more sophisticated reduces the reserves. And so what I'm going to do as we do our survey through World Coal is I'm going to take the reserves as an upper limit for the remaining production. If we can find a trend through a rate plot, I'll use it. But if we can't, then I'll use the reserves. But we have to take into account the fact that these are probably too high. So I'll, now I'll go through some regions of the world quickly, um, and I'll skip some. I gave, there's a reference to sp online spreadsheet that has all of them. Uh, and so if, if you want, are interested in details, you can do it. This is east of the Mississippi the fits for 37 billion tons. It's, it looks like we're over halfway through the eastern coal. The Chinese coal, the Chinese have the largest production in the world. This is a rate plot for China. It's about a 40-year trend, so it's, it's, it's a, a good rate plot. The trend line is for 88 billion tons, which is the largest for any of the regions that we'll look at. This is the rate plot for Europe. The spectacular thing for Europe is the countries that are going through this reserves collapse. You can see the note there that the reserves in 1999 were 122 billion tons. The reserves now are 44 billion tons. And so the countries are each going through this sequence. France closed its last mine. The former West Germany will close its mines over the next 10 years. This is the rate plot for South Asia. Now, this is an exception. The production is growing at 5% a year, and that's why the line is horizontal. So in this case, we can't do a trend, and we'll use the reserves. Now, this is mainly India, and India has just revised its reserves substantially down by about 40 billion tons. Again, this kind of thing is unknown in oil and gas to have these huge reductions down in reserves. This is the former Soviet Union, and you can see the effect of the collapse. And what I've done is to draw a trend from before the time, you might say the good times, the good times before the collapse. Uh, it's, I don't know whether they will get back up to that trend or not. There are two aspects of coal production in the former Soviet Union that are extremely unfavorable. The European coal comes mainly from the Ukraine and they are way past their peak coal production. And if it were another country in Europe, they probably would have already changed to coal simply at producing mines and the reserves would drop dramatically. The Russian coal is mainly in Siberia and Siberia has not recovered from the collapse of the Soviet Union. The economy is about half the size it was then. Now we can add them all up. And we're interested in the center column, that's projections. And when we add them up, we get about 430 billion tons. And that's about half of the world's reserves. Now, you can see several 
places where I don't have a trend and so I've used reserves. That's Montana, Central and South America, which are growing at about 6% per year, and of course South Asia that we spoke about. And for those, we're probably high. On the other hand, it's possible that the former Soviet Union will eventually start to produce more of that coal in, in Siberia. So I don't know, only time will tell whether I've gotten this balance right. One other interesting aspect is that in some sense the reserves are joining the projection. Again, this is the opposite from oil. I, I've marked the regions where the reserves have been substantially reduced recently and the, the Academy of Sciences study has given a fair warning that the U.S. reserves will be reduced the next time they do a survey. And, and I've mentioned the former Soviet Union may never reduce them. Question? Oh, um, that would be, I, I should have said that. Um, tons of oil equivalent. Uh, in the end, when I add them up, I'll be converting to tons of oil for this audience. So, um, but if it were a coal audience, it would be that first number, which would be 430 billion tons. Yeah, tr trillion barrels of oil. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks for the correction. It took a while to... Get it. <laughs> okay, and again? Uh huh. Yes, that would be a wonder. In fact, uh, you, you could come do the talk. I could quit. Uh, this would be, uh, it would be to say that the mineable coal is half of the reserves. Um, now, that's, that's not to say that there's much more coal down there. Um, there's a lot of coal we won't get up. For example, if there's coal under my house, we won't get that coal. It's, it's very different from oil and that. Um, and the, the final one, uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, the final comment on this is that the UN scenarios assume something like 10 times as much coal is available, which again is a completely different number from what the, the trends give you. Now we can add, add them all up. Uh, and the bottom curve is the coal, and then we can add the top, uh, the oil and gas trend that we did before, and so this gives us a total for it. Now, I'll mark one place here, the 90% point. I, I know the focus of this conference is the peak, um, but for, for the question of climate, uh, maybe the 90% is a better one. The other question that arises is, what kind of alternatives do you have? And I think it is worth taking one slide for those. When we talk about alternatives, we have to have a completely different mindset. Um, thinking about the fossil fuel exhaustion where there are very long-term trends almost makes you think like an actuary. Um, it's, it's very long trends, everything dies. For this other kinds of production for alternatives is more like conventional manufacturing where you have short time frames to talk about and there will be changes and new things that arise. So I've listed three here that I think have the potential for making a contribution that's comparable to hydroelectric power and nuclear power which have each been about 15% of world electricity for oh, at least 10 years. Uh, one is wind. That one has increased by a factor of 10 and nine years. It's, it's clearly going to get there. The next is biofuels. And this one is a, a little less than 1% of world oil. Uh, this is tougher because there are trade-offs with conventional agriculture. It also has its own energy requirements. Nevertheless, just looking at the trend, I think it's likely that it will make a similar contribution. And the third is solar. This is at a lower level now. Photovoltaics are only one-tenth of a percent of world electricity. Um, this is a case where, speaking as an electrical engineer, I would urge you to be patient. Um, this is, the capacity in this has increased by a factor of 100 in the last 20 years, and there's every indication that they will continue that trend. One that's 
interesting and important for us, where I come from in California, is concentrating solar thermal. Uh, it's important because it's now starting to get a price range which is starting to be competitive. The current bids that I see are in the range of 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, it tends to be near the middle of the day when you produce it. Um, we have, in some of our utilities, have peak pricing. If you buy electricity, I don't know if people are here from their region, um, depending on your use, you may pay from 20 to 50 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and so there is, this is now starting to make sense for us. Now let's go back to the climate issue. I've put our projection, that's the curve that we just looked at here, first converted it to uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and then you see something to me truly amazing. Um, it's less than all 40 of these UN scenarios. And it's still less than all 40, even if you use full coal reserves, which uh, given the trends in the reduction in the, in the reserves uh, are already, I think, a pretty good maximum. Now, I'm not the first person to notice this. Yes, question? I'll, I'll try to... Um, yes, I, I think I understand the question now. What these trends indicate is that um, the carbon dioxide emissions would be less, substantially less than all 40 of the IPCC scenarios that are used, the UN scenarios. Question in the back, yes. If you could say that question a little louder, please. I'm sorry, I've got the microphone. It's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. I am close. It's it's late. I'm <laughs> um, it, I, but I'll I'll try to answer that particular question. Is that I, I listed the numbers that the. IPCC, UN assumes are available, are dramatically larger than these trends give you, factors of 10 or so. So that's the basic answer. And I'm not the first person, Jean Larrere has pointed this out extremely forcefully. Uh, it doesn't seem to have mattered. Now, we've got two simulations, one for carbon dioxide levels and one for temperature. Now, these are based on Tom Wigley's program, which is a publicly available program called MAGIC. It was used in the first three assessments. Uh, so it, it is one that's been uh, out there for quite a while. But it's one you can download and it, you can drive it if you're not fully skilled in this business. The black curves on the left are projections, are projection. The dashed line is one policy that I have. It's a stretch out, like a Kyoto Protocol that would give a 50% stretch out but it has the same total fossil fuel burning as the Kyoto Protocol would give. And then the green curve, the solid one, is the result for the carbon dioxide, and that peak level is about 450 parts per million. Now, to put this into a temperature, that's, that's part of the same program. I'll show three different curves here. Our first one is the projection. That's the solid red curve, and the projection is for a rise of 1.7 degrees C with a peak in the next century. Now, the blue curve is the part of that curve that's due to future coal burning, because that's the focus of this talk. And you can do that simply by running it again without the coal and subtracting. Now, it's interesting, if you look at that curve, it has a droop a small droop, and you can calculate a recovery time for that group, that droop. It's about 800 years. Now, the reason that number is important is it's larger than any conceivable time to burn fossil fuels. Mine fossil fuel time is 70 years to get to 90 percent. 
other people may vary. No one has 800 years worth of fossil fuel burning. And that means something very important. It means that if I'm going to burn a ton of coal, it doesn't matter whether I do it now, whether I do it in 2100, or whether I do it at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It has the same effect. And you can see this in the dashed curve there, which is the 50% stretch out, which is like the Kyoto Protocol. The dashed curve gives you a slight delay, and you pay for it with a slight increase at the peak. Now, there's one more thing, conclusion, that you can make from this curve. The contribution from U.S. coal is 0.1 degrees, a tenth of a degree C of the rise. Now, this is the part that you could reduce by carbon capture and burial, as our first speaker talked about. I don't know whether you can get the Chinese or the Indians to bury their coal. Uh, there was, uh, by coincidence, the president of India visited my university a month ago, and I asked him, will India bury its coal? And he said, no. He was an engineer, so I, he understood the question. Uh, with the Chinese, the Chinese use their coal raw without even washing it. They could save hundreds of thousands of lives a year if they simply wash the coal. Clearly, they will do this first before they talk about capturing the carbon dioxide and burying it. Now we can sum up for Randy. Um, the projection for the remaining coal production is half of reserves. The projection for the year of 90% exhaustion is 2076. This gives you the time frame for thinking about alternatives. Major conclusion, if you want to reduce the temperature peak that's coming in the next century, you have to reduce the ultimate production. You can't simply slow it down. And this leads us to a proposal. I imagine a conversation I have with my great-great-granddaughter, and that is, wouldn't she appreciate having these fossil fuels in the ground rather than flattened mountains, carbon dioxide in the air, or even buried? Now, there is a possibility here. Federal lands account for one-third of fossil fuel production, and the production is regulated through a system of leases. If we simply stopped giving new leases, production would dry out gradually over the next 50 years. But it would allow us some flexibility, or I should say my great-great-grandchildren, some flexibility. As an example, Ken DeFays and Dave Goodstein, if you've read his book, have emphasized that oil, gas, and coal have very special chemical properties that we lose if we simply burn them. We could leave our descendants feedstock for a petrochemical industry. And so I'll conclude, the takeaway messages are, for climate change, less mineable coal is good news. Uh, but we do need to keep up these high, this high growth rate that we have for the alternatives. Thank you.